The Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to worship on this Lord's Day, this fifth Sunday in the season of Epiphany. We are heading towards Transfiguration Sunday uh, next Sunday, and with Ash Wednesday the following week on the 17th of February, uh, we will enter the season of Lent. Our Ash Wednesday service this year will be uh, recorded for broadcast beginning at uh, 12 noon on the 17th. It is a joint shared worship service with the Congregation of Westminster Presbyterian Church, our sister church just up the street, as well as participation uh, by members of our college uh, community as well. So do plan to um, be a part of that. It'll be a communion service. Uh, it will go, as I said, it will go live at um, 12 noon, but then can be seen uh, by tuning in to our website or YouTube at uh, any time following that. Another very, very special event is coming next Saturday, the 13th of February. It is a drive-by or drive-through celebration uh, of the time, the work, the uh, energy and passion that our good colleague in the office, Donna Rulon, has put in for so many years. She is going into a most deserved retirement, and we want to be here for that hour, 1 p.m. to 2 p.m., to wish her well in her new life in uh, South Carolina. Also, I want to draw your attention to the flowers by the pulpit. Uh, they are given by Pat Bear in honor and celebration of Donna and in great appreciation and thanksgiving for all of the work that she has done and especially for helping with our deacon ministry here at the church. Uh, thank you, Pat, for honoring Donna in this way. And now, let us prepare our hearts to worship God. Good morning. Our composers today come from the United States over the course of three centuries. First of all, Dan Locklear, who is composer in residence and uh, professor of music at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem. He was born in 1949, and the prelude, uh, The Peace May Be Exchanged, comes from his rubrics, which is a liturgical suite. And he took as his inspiration rubrics or instructions from the Episcopal uh, Book of Common Prayer. And so this is his response to the text on the passing of the peace during the course of the service. As you can tell from the character of the peace, his church's passing of the peace is very different from ours here at First Pres. The musical offering is by American Dale Wood, uh, who lived from 1934 to 2003, spent most of his life in California, and served a number of churches there. He had a special affinity for American folk tunes, and he's known uh, among church organists for his skill in arranging those sorts of pieces. Uh, today is a great example of that, uh, working with Let Us Break Bread Together on Our Knees. Portions of the verses for that uh, spiritual date back to the 1700s, and various words have been added uh, by oral tradition over the centuries. The tune first became known um, widely in 1926 when it was published in the second book of Negro Spirituals. Um, interestingly uh, to me to find out today, this hymn did not become associated with communion until around the Civil War, and now it feels inseparable. Finally, um, our oldest composer, W. Eugene Thayer, who lived from 1838 to 1889, he lived in the midst of the 19th century when American musicians and composers were trying to find their own way while still working with the European models uh, that they had in their heads and as part of their training. In fact, Thayer uh, was a student of John Knowles Payne, one of the best known uh, musicians and teachers of the 19th century here, but he, Thayer also went to Berlin to study there. He worked in Boston and New York and actually toured as a virtuoso organist. His postlude today has uh, that sense of the 19th century and American music trying to come into its own. Thank you.
I invite you to join me in our call to worship. Despite the bleakness of the daily news, we trust that in God's world, all things are possible. Those called unclean can be made whole. The weak may become strong. The darkest night yields today. Morning may turn into dancing. Joy follows weeping. When we cry out for help, we trust in the hope that God will hear. In God's world, all things are possible. Come, let us worship our God of healing and of wholeness. Let us pray. Gracious God, we gather near to you to pray to receive your renewing touch. Through this community of compassion, may we experience love that heals, grace that relieves our sense of guilt, and a word that assures us of your purpose in our lives. Amen. Please pray with me our prayer of confession and then pray silently. The gifts of God come to us in an open hand. They are given gently and quietly, but we are a people of noise and clamor, and our gifts, O oh God, so often wait for us in vain. At every moment, you reach out to touch us in the very heart of our being, yet so often we prefer our own pain and confusion. For all the moments that we have missed your presence, for all the days we have not experienced your willing and giving love, for all the times we have lived as if we did not need you. For all of this, we offer our sorrow and we wait in expectation for your healing touch. Gracious God, hear our prayers, amen. This is the good news, my friend. God remembers us and forgives us and calls us so that we may live as people of love and hope for the sake of all creation. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please turn to those around you and offer a gesture of peace. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Amen. Hello. Have you ever been involved right in the middle of a game? You're almost winning and then boom, power dies. The battery dies. Or maybe you're sitting on an airplane or in the car or even in your bedroom reading a book, an electronic book, and you're reading and reading and you get just to the good part, the battery dies. Or maybe you're on a really important phone call with your very best friend across the county and you haven't seen them in 10 weeks and, hello? Hello? Are you there? Your battery dies. All of these wonderful things that we have that are such fun tools that we can use to distract us from what's going on, to engage our minds and to learn, and to be able to talk and communicate with people. They all have to be charged, don't they? They all have to be charged, and every night you put them on the charging dock, right? You plug it in, you put it on its thing so it can charge. So every day we can do it again. It reminds me of myself. I need to recharge myself. And sometimes that looks like taking a quiet walk, reading a book, sitting somewhere by myself, or engaging with people. It also reminds me of some stories in the Bible where Jesus is out preaching and he needs to quietly come back and pray and recharge his soul, recharge his mind, so that he can do it again the next day. I think that's a really important reminder to us because if Jesus needed to recharge himself, then we certainly need to recharge ourselves. If Jesus knew that the way to get the most out of his mind and spirit and body and the way to connect with God the most, he had to recharge. Jesus had to take some time out. Jesus had to pray. Jesus had to meditate. Jesus had to walk away. And recharge himself. I think that's telling for us too. 
We've certainly been through a year, and we've got some more struggles ahead of us as we continue to plow through this different time. And I think we all need to recharge. I think that means sometimes we just go pray. Sometimes it's at night when we sleep and we get a good rest. Sometimes it's out on the soccer field when we just are really hitting it. And we're out there really going, giving it our all. Recharging for each one of us is going to look different, but I think it's important that each one of us takes a minute to recharge our soul, recharge our spirits. So I challenge you this week. Think about when you're feeling stressed and you're feeling angry or you might be anxious or tired. How do you need to recharge? Put your game down. Put it on its docking station. Put your book away, or maybe this is what you need. Get a paper book. It won't run out of batteries. And recharge your soul. Maybe say a simple prayer. Jesus did. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for reminding us to recharge our souls so that we can be especially tuned to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have two uh, readings from the Bible this morning. The first one is Psalm 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you healed me. O Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol, restored me to life from among those gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, all you, his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you had established me as a strong mountain. You hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Our second reading is from the second book of Kings, chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. And this is the story of the healing of the Syrian general, Naaman. Let us hear the story for this morning. Naaman, commander of the army of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram, the man through a mighty warrior, the man though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now the Arameans on one of their raids had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, Go then, and I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. Naaman went, taking with him six talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold and 10 sets of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, 
When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you my servant, Naaman, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life, that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance to Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached him and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was, wash and be clean. So Naaman went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. As this pandemic grinds on, even with the hopes of increasing vaccinations, we still see the devastation and death of this disease. Still know too many people who are becoming infected, still aware personally or anecdotally of the economic pain and suffering. And even into a year of all of this, we do not know what the future holds. In times like these, I do not know whether it is helpful for us to acknowledge all of this pain in the context of our worship or not. Perhaps we just need a liturgical space to escape from the grim realities. Or maybe it is better to confront these realities with our stories of faith in order to gain a perspective or some comfort in situations that are beyond our control. In these past many months, on top of our collective COVID anxieties, some have experienced the added sorrows of the sickness and death of those in our families and fellowship who are close to us. All of these situations beg the unanswerable question. Where is God when God's people are hurting? When the whole world, God's sons and daughters, are in deepest pain? When even the earth and all creation is groaning? The Bible readings for today's worship seem to complicate this thorny, theological, and troubling practical question. Healing stories in the Bible are tricky things. Usually, the healing comes to just one person, 
and rarely is it clear why that one deserved it over another. If we had read the gospel story that accompanies these other texts in the lectionary, we would have heard about the healing of a man with leprosy. It seems he was cured because he cried out as Jesus passed by. But why heal just one leper? If Jesus had the cure, why not eradicate leprosy once and for all? When we turn to the story of Naaman, the situation is even more complicated. Naaman was the commander of the Syrian army, an army that was accustomed to fighting and defeating Israel. When Naaman showed up before the king of Israel, the king was sure it was to pick a fight. For the king to offer Naaman a cure, even if it were possible, would be giving aid to the enemy. This story has an uneasy history in the Bible. In the Gospel according to Luke, when Jesus stood up in the synagogue in Nazareth to preach his first sermon, he commented that there were many lepers in Israel in the old days, but God chose to heal Naaman the Syrian. Upon hearing that provocative interpretation, the people in the synagogue were so enraged that they tried to throw Jesus off a cliff. It was like saying there were many people in Worcester suffering with cancer, but God chose to heal the close associate of Osama bin Laden. Such a thought defies all human logic. But many of our Bible stories defy logic, or at least push us to stretch that logic. For all the tales we have of the Israelites conquering Canaan and establishing a kingdom, there are persistent voices in the Bible that counter such empire building. God protects the stranger. God cares for the alien. God loves the enemy. And therefore, so should we. Those voices were difficult to hear back when the people were under threat and often living under foreign occupation. And those voices are difficult to hear today when the clamor is still loud for sealing the borders and suspecting the foreigner and fearing attack. It is hard to hear the voice that speaks from the first uh, epistle of John, chapter 4, saying, perfect love casts out fear. And it's even harder to live as if that were true. That an enemy general would be healed is one startling feature of this story. Another is that the healing took place at all. Naaman almost missed it. For all his power and wealth, Naaman could not obtain a cure for his disease until he listened to a young servant girl. And then, when he had when he had received the means by which he could be cured, his pride nearly kept him from it. Are not the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? Naaman turned away in rage. It was those servants, those at the bottom of the social order, who stepped in and reasoned with him. Left to himself, <clears throat> Naaman would have missed his healing. But the compassion 
and care of those around him enabled him to receive his cure. I suspect this happens more often than we realize. Healing comes from unlikely sources, at unexpected times, in unlooked-for ways, perhaps for ills we did not even know we had. And sometimes the healing hurts. We all have our pain and our diseases. We are all in need of healing of some kind or another. What we suffer from may be a physical, physical matter, or it may reside in our memories, a hurt, a poor choice, a bad decision in a past that cannot be changed. The beginning of the cure may come in letting go of the things that have gone by and immersing in the brisk waters of the present. Naaman's pride and power blocked the possibility of his healing. But when he surrendered those impediments, his life was transformed and he was made whole. Naaman's healing brought a reorientation of his life. No longer would the old gods, the artificial props of wealth and status, be enough to sustain him. From then on, he would serve the giver of life, the one who may heal the body, but most certainly would heal the heart. As we hear this ancient story today, We do not need to be reminded of the sickness and hurt in the world. We see it every day in our own experiences. Surely, we know that eventually our lives will succumb to the inevitable ends of disease and death, the uncertainties of our physical well-being, especially in these times, contribute to our anxieties. These are the hard edges of the cycle of life. Our times are uncertain and the future lies in mystery. But our stories give us hope that the night will pass and joy will come in some unimaginable morning. The hope of our faith is that beyond immediate hard realities and the pain of current sufferings, we may yet be able to say with the poet of Psalm 30, you have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. May it be so for you and for me. Amen.
At the beginning of our worship service today, I neglected to invite you to, if you had not already assembled the communion elements in the midst of where you are worshiping today, that you press pause on the recording and go and gather bread and juice or wine and set it down. And then press the button again and join us as we celebrate communion this Lord's Day. We have just heard a message that speaks of a healing. And I can think of no time in any time that I know when we need healing more than this time. And so as we are fed and nourished by the gifts set before us at this table, may it bring a healing. A healing that comes from the inside out and that radiates. Please come, eat, drink. All are welcome here. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pray. In that time when there was only you, wondrous God, you walked in the midst of chaos, shaping all that is good and beautiful. In the places where there was only your love, you stretched out your hands, scooping the dirt off earth's floors, shaping us in your image, breathing spirit into our lungs. In that silence where there was only your hope, You called us to be your people, God of glory and wonder. But the world sang its seductions. Sin called us to follow its despair. Death blinded us to the life you offered. But you would not pay attention to our foolish ways, nor would you leave us in the grasp of death and sin, trusting that if we encountered the grace wrapped in your holiness, we would turn to you in joy. Holy are you, sanctuary of our hearts, and blessed is Jesus Christ, word of joyous grace. In that time when we had lost our way, he called to us so we could follow him into your joy. In that time when all hope had faded, He touched our lips with the bright fire of your love. In that time when death's cold grip wrapped tightly around our hearts, he came and surrounded us with your love. In this time of holy silence, Spirit of God, may this bread which is broken become our wholeness, In this time of grace, may this cup which is poured touch our lips with healing. In this time, when we feel the brush of your fingertips caressing us, may we believe that your justice and peace are to be shared with all peoples, that our hearts can bear the burdens of others, that we may bring joy to the lonely and suffering. Then, when our journey is ended and we have followed you into the mystery beyond, we will gather around your table in that silence, which is only your grace, in that place, which is only your heart, in that time, which is only your love, God in community, holy in one. Hear us now as we join our voices praying the prayer Jesus taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, we remember that Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in me and poured out for you. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim and live God's saving grace to the end of time. And now I invite you to take bread and pass it around your circle, wherever you are, and for each to take a piece from it, and then pass the chalice, dipping into the cup and remembering that these are the gifts of God for the whole people of God. And so we say, thanks be to God. The bread of hope, the cup of healing and wholeness. Let us pray. Gracious God, healer of all things, we have come to this table. We have come to you this day, seeking that healing, seeking that hope, that love that casts out all fear. We pray that as we continue on in this season and enter the season of Lent, that our lives may be truly blessed by your Spirit, that you will keep us in the palm of your hand, that you will hold us for the day that we can gather together in worship and in praise and in continuing acts of service. In Jesus' name, amen. I come to this ending of the service, and the rubrics are blessing and benediction. And I've always felt that at the end of our worship together, wherever or whenever or whatever it is, that for us to be able to go out into the world as bearers of the light, as beacons of hope, we need blessing and we need benediction. And I think that is most especially true as these weeks have turned to months and now nearly a year that the world has been suffering 
from COVID-19. The glimmer of hope, medically speaking, is there's a vaccination or two or three or more maybe, and they're being given. Of course, we need to be honest. It will be a long, long time before that vaccination reaches all corners of this globe of ours. But that is still hope. And my hope for today is that the story of Naaman's reluctant healing can provide us with something to go on, can provide us with some hope. And we have been nourished today at the Lord's table. And so we take that taste, that taste of life with us. Take heart. Continue to practice safe distancing and masking. Take that vaccine when it becomes available to you. Respect all others. And let us model this week and in the months to come the way of Jesus, the way of compassion and mercy, the way of hope. As you leave your place of worship this day, go knowing that you are embraced in the steadfast love of God forever, that you are redeemed in the grace of Jesus Christ now and always, that together we are being empowered for faithful witness and loving service each and every day of our lives. And may God's hope peace, joy, and love abide with you. Amen.